a tenara tato kato e te hari. Uh, members, we uh, the the committee is resumed. Uh, we are debating um, the Overseas Investment Amendment Bill Part One. Andrew Bailey has the call, and he has two minutes thirty three seconds remaining. Should he wish to do so, I call Andrew Bailey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, yeah, I was cut off in my prime. I thought just before the dinner break. And I, I had been talking about the illogicality of this bill, no, Mr well, Chair, well. about the issue of why we want to promote more foreign ownership in the forestry industry, which is already 72 per cent owned by foreigners, and we think we should allow 100 per cent, yet on the other side, in the housing sector, we've only got 3 per cent of houses being sold to foreigners, but that is the issue. I can't understand that, Mr Speaker. But where I was just moving on to was we heard 213 submissions in the uh, Finance and Expenditure Committee. And I've got to say, as a, minute, a member of that committee, I actually felt quite embarrassed. I did, Mr. S Mr. Chair. I felt quite embarrassed because there was just this avalanche of submitters who came in and just hammered our committee. And a lot of the members held their Heads and shame, Mr. Chair. And so what they did, what happened? That, that's right. Unfortunately, they had to, Mr. Carter. And what happened was that we then saw a proliferation of minor changes as each of these uh, submitters came in and, re and worked the issue through and showed how illogical, how wrong this piece of legislation was. So just to deal a bit of fact, the definition of overseas person in the Act is defined as someone who's uh, been living in New Zealand for 12 months or a person present for at least the last 183 days or New Zealand tax resident. And that sounds all very good. So if you're not one of those people and you're a foreigner in effect, you need to apply for a consent to be involved in buying a house. And you may avoid what's called the counterfactual process or test. And a counterfactual is normally an OIO requirement is that if you are a foreigner and you're buying a piece of land or a business, what you do must be more than the best New Zealander would do with that same asset. And so to avoid that test, which is actually quite a strong test, uh, you have to demonstrate that you've got a commitment to live in New Zealand, that you're developing the land to create increased housing as the term, provided you sell that development once you get to completion, or you use the land for non-residential purposes, which may, of course, have a component where it has a house on. So that's all very well. But my first two observations around that carve-out is that the government is happy for a foreigner to land bank for future housing in New Zealand. That's what this legislation means. It means they are prepared to see foreigners, Mr. Ch there, Mr. Chair, Mr. Mr. Chair. Thank you. They are prepared to allow foreigners to come in here and land bank uh, good New Zealand land for the purpose of eventually uh, building houses on it. And of course, that's, uh, most people who are involved in the building industry know that's where you make your money. And buying the land before it's rezoned and taking it through to, to a process where you can sell those sections. And the second observation I would make, Mr. Chair, is that if you're a foreigner, we've got huge problems in uh, Pukekohe. If you're a foreigner and you buy an existing business, the way to get around this is to make sure it's got a house on it. If you've got a house on it, you will get approval and then you can then spend your 20 million doing the house. That's the only way to get around this bill. But there are ways of getting around it. So if we were really trying to stop this, and these are wealthy people, these are the people that Mr Mark Patterson was slighting off before earlier in the speech, saying how we shouldn't have these wealthy people coming into New Zealand, which I just find absurd. Uh, this is the way that they will get around it. So I'm not sure this carve-out actually works. And so what did we do? What were the damage limitation rules that were introduced into the bill? Well, the first change is that in order to promote foreigners building new properties or houses, there's a dispensation for those who build 20 or more houses. And you would be able to get a consent to sell 60% of those houses to foreigners. And of course, that was in recognition 
to the blindingly obvious that in many cases New Zealanders need to be able to sell houses to a range of investors to be able to get the project off the line. And that banks require pre-sales. And of course, but suddenly there's a recognition by the government that we should make a dispensation. But of course, it means that, that you can sell 60% to overseas investors, and these buyers will not be required to on sell, but they can live in, uh, will not be able to live in them and therefore be able to rent them. And I'll come back to this. And then in terms, that's a buyer category, in terms of the developer herself who may be doing the apartment build or terrace house, house development, there would be um, no requirement for them so they could come in, buy the land, sit on it for five years, build the, uh, the terrace home or the apartments, and then not sell, provided there's a shared equity basis, or rent to buy or rental. And so it sounds all very good, but this is the rub. This is the rub. The way if you're going to get around that rule, what you will do, you will be that foreigner who comes in, land banks, uh, builds the houses, then you will rent it out. And you'll rent it out to your, to your daughter or son or son-in-law on a term not less than five years, but just under five years, and you will be able to use that property. So actually the rules don't work. And that's the issue I have with the rules. If you're going to try and carve something out, make the rules work, there, it's a, these rules do not apply and will not apply, and I think people will find a hole around them, unfortunately. And then, of course, there's the issue around uh, hotels. There's a similar arrangement where you can take part of a, you can take part of the hotel, but of course you can get, um, you can get, uh, you can retain that as long as you don't, uh, you don't use it more than 30 days a year. But of course, all this comes, raises the issue around the OIO compliance. And we heard from the committee uh, officials that at the moment, I think the OIO processes about 150 uh, uh, applications a year. And under this arrangement, they believe they will need to uh, process about 4,000. 4,000 of these. And how are they going to ensure that the person who built the pro pro uh, apartments who rented it to their daughter, how will they go back in five years' time and check it? Or in seven years' time and work its way through? So I think that's a really significant issue, and I don't think that practicality of this whole thing, again, it makes the Act unworkable, Mr Chair. I think that's a crucial deficiency in this Act. And I think the other thing was around the issue of residential housing providers. I want get, to return, this, uh, return back to this, hopefully I'll get another call at some point, because that is also part of a way of creating new housing stock in New Zealand. Residential housing providers like Ryman, Metro Life Care, and under the rules, they are precluded because they've got more than 25 per cent foreign ownership. I think those are issues, again, if you're trying to promote housing in New Zealand, we've actually carved them out of this arrangement. I can't understand how this bill works and what the intent of it is. Mr Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Um, I call the Honourable David Parker. Uh, Mr Chairman, I want to talk to...